before orcas were known as the intelligent, social, and family-oriented mammals as they are today, before they were correctly identified as the largest member of the dolphin family. They were feared and hated, treated like sea vermin. This was how orcas got the name whale killers or killer whales. In this country, hundreds of years ago, we used to have whaling ships go out and harpoon humpback whales and blue whales for their oil, for their blubber, even sometimes for their meat. And there are many accounts of sailors seeing packs, groups of these black and white sea creatures. And they would invoke fear in the hearts of these men because they would watch in horror as these packs would tear apart humpbacks, blue whales, dolphins, porpoises, seals. There's even accounts of them rising up out of the ocean and snatching a low-flying bird right out of the air. Words like mortified, terrified, horrified, were used on a constant basis. They were also known as the sea wolves of the oceans. And man treated them just like man treats wolves and coyotes on land. They saw no difference between the orcas in the Atlantic Ocean as they traveled further south, as they kept killing these humpbacks and these blue whales, as they did the orcas in the Pacific Northwest and in off British Columbia and Canada that were fish-eating orcas. There was no difference. The fishermen in the Pacific Northwest wanted to catch salmon in their nets. They didn't want to see orcas. They were terrified of them. So they would go out in their boats and they would harpoon them and kill them. They would shoot them and kill them with their rifles. That's how they were treated. And that's how they were looked upon. The, and I can't emphasize this enough, okay? I mean, they were whale killers. And they wanted nothing to do with them. Nobody wanted anything to do with orcas. The very first orca ever caught by men was, they figured to be uh, 7 to 10 feet long. They named her Wanda. She was swimming alone. And as they watched her, they saw behavior in her that they thought she was sick. She was ill, it, which it turned out she was. She was very sick. She was very ill. And that's possibly why she was alone. And they tried to catch her, but she kept evading them. They corralled her into this bay. And they would try to throw a net, a throw a net over her and catch her, and she would evade it, evade her. And after, you know, a, 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 some time had gone by, people started noticing what was happening, that there was this orca in this bay, and, and these fishermen were trying to catch it. And every time she evaded their nets, the people on the shore would cheer for the the whale killer. They didn't want the man to catch her. But after so long, they did. They caught her with nets, ropes. 
tied her down to this metal contraption and then dumped her into this tiny tank. Now, once they got her into the tank, she, between the time they caught her and the time she died, was 48 hours. Because once she was in the tank, she just kept ramming her head up against the wall. Wanted to kill herself. That was 1961. The next orca to come into man's hands was ultimately named Moby Doll. Now, Moby Doll has got all kinds of crazy theories and stories around him. And it's really hard to differentiate between fact and fiction. I've tried really hard. I've read a lot. Um, but, okay. This took place in uh, British Columbia. No, the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, this was in the summer of 1964. This was in the Pacific Northwest. And one story is, is that an artist hired some fishermen to go out, kill an orca, and then bring the body to him so he could make a life-size sculpture of this orca. I don't know. Another story is, is that a bunch of scientists hired these fishermen to go out, harpoon an orca, and bring it into them dead so that they could dissect him, research him, run tests on him. I don't know. Because he did end up, there was a bunch of scientists where, you know, where he ended up. So I don't know about that story. What I do know is this. When they caught him, they shot, they, they shot the harpoon to kill him. It hit him right in the back of the head, the lower part of the head. They meant to kill this orca, but they didn't. Moby Doll didn't die. So they decided to tow him to this port near an army, army base. And... It was really strange because Moby Doll knew not to pull on this line. He swam along and had the presence and the intelligence of mind to know that he didn't want to make this wound. He was already hurt, badly injured. He didn't want to make it any worse. So he just like swam along. So, so there was never any tension between the line and the harpoon. They got him there and... They make this square uh, sea pen and they, they wrap them up in ropes and nets because, you know, everybody's scared to death of them. They pull out the harpoon and they try to codify the wound as best they can. And they put them in this tank. Now, they're pretty certain because, you know, He's in the, he's in British Columbia, that he probably eats fish, but they're throwing him these little tiny one foot long fish, like herring and stuff. He doesn't want nothing to do with it. And after a few days of that, they start throwing him all kinds of crap, like uh, octopus, like red meat, beef, like bacon. This orchid is not eating. Now, there's a man in Seattle named Ted Griffin, and he finds out about this. And he goes up there to where this orca is. And they put him on display for one day, and one day only. And they figure that uh, 10,000 people saw Moby Doll in one day. And they decide that Moby Doll is a female. Okay. Moby Doll was about 15 feet long, so a, probably a juvenile. Or 14 feet long. I'm sorry. And so 
Ted Griffith goes up there and sees what's going on there. And there's two accounts. One of the scientists and Ted Griffin. And knowing how much I've read about Ted Griffin and all of this stuff, I believe Ted Griffin's account. The lead scientist was not around. Ted Griffin said he just pushed his way in, which I totally believe. Saw how gaunt and skinny the Arca was. Grabbed the biggest salmon he could and, and slapped it on top of the water. Like, you know, here's a kill. Come and share it with me. Moby Doll swiftly came up, looked at the salmon with one eye and him, and took the salmon from it. It's the first time an orca ever got head uh, hand fed by a man. Okay, and Ted Griffith did it. But almost two months had gone by. With Moby Doll not eating any food. Right? Now the craziest rumor is that there was this four or five year old girl just happened to be standing by the lead scientist. And said, I don't think Moby Doll is a girl. And the lead scientist says, why not? And she says, well, look. And supposedly his member was on full display. Now I don't believe that. Because there were scientists around Moby Doll all the time. He never showed any genitalia. Never showed it. Right? And there was this running joke, which I'm not going to repeat. So I think 16 or 17 days before Moby Doll died, did Ted Griffith go up there and start feeding him salmon? And I have another picture of another scientist feeding him by hand, feeding him salmon, finally giving him what he needed. But between... The wound that they did, not a good job at um, fixing and him starving for almost two months. Moby Doll died. And then they did dissect him. And that's when they found out that he was a male. Also, the security around this sea pen near this army base, it wasn't very good. So they think in total about 20,000 people saw Moby Doll. He lived for 67 days in that sea pen. That was in the summer of 1964. Later in the year, salmon fishermen pull up a 21, 22 foot long orca. And they are completely freaked out. I mean, <laughs> petrified. They don't know how they caught this orca. They don't want nothing to do with this orca. They're just flipping out, right? And they can see Namu's family waiting for him offshore. So there's even more orcas around, which is flipping them out even more. And they don't know what to do. You know, he's, he's, he's tangled up in all these nets, okay? So, Ted Griffin, one more time in Seattle, gets around. Now, he races up there as fast as he can. And most people believe he paid $8,000 for this orca who he named Namu. There are other reports of, you know... 9,000, 9,500, 10,000. So I'm just going to say for the sake of whoever's telling the truth, between eight and $10,000 was paid for this orca. What Ted Griffith does is immediately starts constructing this huge sea pen. And it was really big, and he did it for two reasons. First of all, Namu was huge. I mean, he was 21, 22 feet long. He was big. And Ted Griffin also wanted it to have enough room for his little boat so he could go in the sea pen with Nemu every day. And he did. He hand fed Nemu every day, got him in the sea pen, and they start this journey together from British Columbia to Washington. And he hand feeds him every day. And he has this long pole with a brush on it big big brush long pole 
And Namu loved being brushed with it. He loved the contact. He would let Ted Griffin brush him all over his body. Right? And then Ted starts petting him with his hand. So he's petting him. He's feeding him by hand. He's brushing him. And then he puts a pole with an orangish ball at the end of it. And teaches Namu to shoot straight up into the air and touch that little ball, that orange ball. And when he would do that and come down, Ted would have a great big salmon waiting for him. And he fed... Namu, 400 pounds of salmon a day, which gives another clue that he was an adult. That's how much salmon adults eat a day, between four and 500 pounds, okay? And then Ted makes the really big move and gets into the water with him and starts swimming with him. And Namu allows it. And they start swimming together every day. And then finally, Ted makes the ultimate move of climbing onto Nemu's back and swimming, holding on to his dorsal. Ted Gribbon was the first human being in history to ride on an orca's back. And Nemu allowed it. Allowed it. Those two were completely bonded. I believe that. I truly believe that. But unlike Namu, Ted had ulterior motives with his bond because he believed people would pay money to see a man swim with an orca. Would pay money to see a man feed an orca, ride on an orca's back. Watch an orca rise up out of the water to touch an orange pole. And Ted was right. But once they took Namu out of that sea pen that he was doing just fine in, in the ocean, and put him in that tank out of his natural environment, Namu started to fade. And Ted... Griffin could not face facts, obviously, because what he thought is that he thought Namu was lonely and needed another orca, a companion, a female. So they put together another hunt, and that's how we ended up with Shamu. Shamu was intended to be Namu's companion and mate. But there were all kind of problems that made this bust. Namu was a northern resident, they believe a member of Seapot. Shamu was a southern re resident, they believe a member of K-Pot. Different dialects, different parts of the world, and the age difference. Shamu was three barely winged, and he was an adult male. This was a catastrophe. So, Ted was not going to let go of Namu. He sells Shamu to SeaWorld San Diego. Shortly after, Namu dies. Okay. Between, from the time he gets Namu in that pen and into the tank and Namu's dead, it's a year. But people did pay to see all of that. So Shamu ends up in, in SeaWorld San Diego and she's put in this pool and people are allowed to see her. But they are, you know, at different times and behind the scenes and all this stuff. They're working furiously with her to train her and have all the notes from Ted and do this and do that. Okay. So that when they finally bring her out and they introduce her, as the apex, you know, predator of the sea, the killer whale, right? People are agog, aghast, amazed, transfixed. This was amazing. 
How did SeaWorld do this? I mean, look at Shamu. She's letting that man put his head in her mouth. They're miracle workers, right? I mean, this is what propelled people from all over to start coming to SeaWorld in droves. Is the taming of the killer whale. Now, none of this worked the way they wanted it to, okay? First of all, they thought the reason why Wanda died, why Moby Doll died, why Namu died was because he was too old. So that's when they started killing the mothers to kidnap the babies. That didn't work out well either. Okay? When an orca's three years old, they're barely weaned. Okay? And they're catching all these babies, and the babies are dying like flies. They catch an orca that they named Kilroy. He was one, for God's sakes. Kilroy had to be with the dolphins for a long time. They sent him to the Sea World in Ohio. Kilroy never did a show. Until near the end of 1968. And I have a picture of them here. A picture of Kilroy and a picture of Shamu and Kilroy together. And once he did start doing shows, you know, past the age of two, they got about nine years out of him. And he died. Shamu was captured when she was three. She died when she was nine. There are so many orcas in the early days that have that story. So many of them. <laughs> and then they bit, they build the bigger tanks. And what they sell to the public about these bigger tanks is that they're doing it to increase their quality of life. That is not the reason. I'll tell you the reason. They did it to increase the wow factor. To get even more people in there. You know, so they can show the trainers flying through the air. With the orcas. So they can have three and four orcas leaping out of the water together at the same time. Doing the same tricks at the same time. Wow factor. Get it? Alright? But there was an imperative. They had to keep these orcas breathing. That's all they've ever given a flying flock about. And they finally did it with this elaborate 24-7 water filtration system. That's how they have kept these orcas breathing. And even that, even, you know, they still don't have a very long lifespan in them. I mean, Amaya, well, how long did she live? Six years? Nakai, how long did he live? I mean, they don't have very long lifespans. We have four exceptions. And they are 100%. Either Icelandic, Northern Resident, or Southern Resident. Okay? And the biggest miracle of, of all four of them is Ulysses, because he was three when he was captured. I don't know how he has arrived into his 40s. Okay? At least um, Corky and Lolita were five years old when they were taken, and they had pod mentality, and they, and they were completely weaned, and they knew how to catch their own food, and they took part in hunts, and... And all of that. But this is the shortest, most accurate history that I can bring you about how this industry started, who started it. It wasn't just Ted Griffin. There are a lot of other people out there that we can shoot darts at. But I'm telling you, this one man, he changed everything with Namu. Everything. Um, I'll see you on the flip side. My next video will be a typical day in the life of a Southern, uh, um, a, a Southern resident pod and a typical day in the life of the orcas held captive hostage at SeaWorld San Diego. Thank you so much for hanging with me, for listening and for watching. Thank you.